Hello and welcome to La Cancha Podcast, a podcast dedicated to speaking about Spanish football. I'm your host, Taj, and we're also going to be discussing football on the continent, but we're going to start in Spain where we had an action-packed Sunday with Real Madrid, with Valencia, with Atleti, but we are going to start on the top of the table with Real Madrid, and Real Madrid during action against Celta Vigo in what can only be described as a game of two halves, Celta Vigo were there in the first half, they came out firing, they make they took advantage of Real Madrid's mistakes, and then but then you could tell that they were beginning to crack. You could see some of the cracks coming in. You felt for Celta, you felt that the pressure was coming, Real Madrid were playing better, they were creating chances. And in the second half, Real Madrid came out storming. Karim Benzema, what a player has been, what a play has been for Real Madrid. He's been their Tasman. And it's interesting to see how he's developed, how he's grown in this team since the departure of Cristiano Ronaldo because he's been their main talisman. He's been the one to lead them when they won La Liga two years ago. And this season, he might win the Pichichi. He's out there in the chart. He scored a hat-trick today. He got an assist. And you can tell how important he is to Real Madrid because when he plays well, they're a totally different team. And another player coming off good stretch in this game is Vinicius Jr., who's been firing on all cylinders this season. He has his best return for Real Madrid in La Liga with four goals already this season. And we're beginning to see a development. We're beginning to see this guy turn into a star because what he lacked in the past was his finishing ability, his ability to make good decisions in the final third. And you're seeing him develop that more and more this season. And that's something that would only take his game to the next level. And possibly the change in style helps. Special mention to Kamvinga. But on the change in style, we're seeing Carl Ancelotti come in. And he's different from Zidane. Because every coach is different from each other. While Zinedine Zidane is the type of player, type of manager, to focus more on keeping a clean sheet, scoring one or two goals, maybe from set piece, maybe from crosses. Carlo is the kind of guy who coaches a team that, and says, okay, if this team scores two, we're going to score five or we're going to score four. And that's what we're seeing. I feel sorry for poor Altibo Kotoa because winning the Zamora means a lot to him. And the Zamora, for those who don't know, is Spain's best goalkeeper. And it seems like he might not win this, this year. <laughs> I think it's, with the way Real Madrid is playing, with the way the defense is, it might be difficult. And maybe that might hurt Real Madrid towards the end. But so far, so good for them. For Celta, it's one point out of 12. As I said, they started this game well. But when push came to shove, they lacked that defensive stillness to be able to get the job done. And part of that had to do with Renato Tapia going off and injured in the first half. And when he went off, they lost all stillness. All hell broke loose for them. Real Madrid were creating chances left, right, and center. And you could tell it was going to be a bit of a pasting, but they also showed fight. They also could have gotten back into the game when it was at 3-2 or 4-2. And they continued to create chances even at 5-2. And that's what I like about them, and hopefully they can do well. But this was a tough game for them. And speaking of tough games, it was not so tough for Valencia, who, I, how good have they been this season? They tore apart Austin and Pamplona. I can't remember the last time they played this well, especially in Pamplona. And it blows my mind that it's the same set of players that were so drab under Javi Gracia, who was performing so well. And Carlos Sola and Gonzalo Guedes have been on top of those improvements. Like, they've been the talisman for Valencia. Soler is on cloud nine at the moment. Anything he touches turns to gold. He had two assists in this game. He's had five goals and two assists throughout the season so far. And it's interesting because he and Guedes could be the cornerstone for something big. If Valencia are to go to Europe, they might be the players who make that happen. And it's staggering Soler's contract situation. His contract runs out in 2023. And... 
Valencia might put themselves in a place where they might be forced to lose him. And they, they almost lost Guedes this summer. He had big offers from Sevilla, from Wolves, from Zenit. And I'm happy he stayed because he's such a joy to watch. Every game I've seen him play this season, and I know the season short, so it's just four games. He's entertained. He's had a positive attitude. He's worked hard. And I love watching him and Valencia play at the moment. But so far, so good. Like I think Valencia fans should get excited. But their next game is going to be a tough test against Real Madrid. And I'm happy that Valencia-Real Madrid is, again, it's again a big game for both clubs right now because of the form both are in. Because last season, it would have been an upset or surprise if Valencia got the results, which they did do a Mestalla and they tend to do a Mestalla against Real Madrid. But this might be different. And I'm going to watch with anticipation. And I think most Spanish football fans are going to watch with anticipation. And speaking of tough tests, what tough test did Atleti get like, at Espanyol? Atleti were, they were disappointed in the first half. They started with their Galactico team that had Griezmann, Llorente, Correa, Suarez, Carrasco, Trippier. I expected them to blow away Espanyol. But it looked like the Atleti from two years ago that were very lackadaisical that had nothing going for them. Griezmann didn't have the best of debuts, like Saul in Chelsea. But as, give credit to Espanyol, because they came out out of the blocks, they were firing. I felt I really enjoyed their energy. But in the second half also, Simeone made some really big changes. He brought on Condobia, he brought on Lamar. And these players made a difference. Like, Condobia and Lamar, they've been making a difference throughout the season. I remember in the game against Salta, they were very good in that game. They were also very good in a number of Atleti's good games. Especially Condobia has been playing in different positions. And special mention to Thomas Lamar. If there's any lesson on perseverance, it is Thomas Lamar. Because the way he's come out, the way he's shown himself to be an improvement to be a star to be to be the driving force of this team it's admirable because this is a guy no one gave a chance a year ago or two years ago if Lamar had left Atleti in 2020 or 2019 Atleti fans would have been rejoicing they would, they would have been dancing on the streets but he's come back he's proved himself to be vital to this team I feel he's as vital to Atleti as Modric and Iniesta were to Madrid and Barcelona respectively and that's a big call. But I feel he's he's shown the performance to make me make that big call. I'm happy he got the goal because the goal he got disallowed in the second half, I don't I think it's one of those things with VAR where it, it's offside, but is it really? So the fact that he got the goal and he got that winner in the 99 minute made me happy because in a generation where stats matter and stats are everything. Seeing a player like that score a goal and get recognized with a stat for his good performance warms my heart. And his goal was in the ninth nine minute, as I mentioned before, and that was the big controversy of this game. Atleti, Atleti got, at, got rewarded with 10 extra minutes to win this game, and that was something that Espanyol was angry about. They sent out a tweet about it, they said it wasn't fair. They said they hoped that it applied to other teams when it came to their turn. But I feel Espanyol, they're not looking at the bigger picture and that there was a lot of time taken away from this game. And I'm happy that the Spanish Federation is putting measures in place for fans to get back that time that's taken away because it took about five minutes when they disallowed Lamar's goal. There was also a cooling break. There was also the substitutions. And there were also players who got injured that we have to take, take account of. And so those 10 minutes were deserved. But I'm also pissed off a bit with Espanyol's attitude in this. Because if you are tying a game, it doesn't matter the opponent. Like, common competitiveness should make you feel like you have an opportunity to win a game. Especially against the champions, but they showed none of that. And I think... That's a poor attitude from them. And I'm happy that poor attitude wasn't rewarded because I don't like to see that happen. 
And speaking of teams who parrots you, another team with a parrot you that I don't like that often is Cadiff. Because I see them as a team that's ultra defensive, a team that's ultra regressive in how they play. Even against a team like Osasuna, Cadiff would have 19 or 20% possession. And that's unacceptable. Like, you need to have teams that are playing the game, that are, even if you're, even if you're going to defend, but you, you counterattack, you don't have 19% possession against your equals. I can understand if you have 19% possession against Madrid or Atleti or Sevilla, but against Espanyol, like, you have 19% possession, that doesn't make sense. And that's why I was so happy when Ross Sudat scored. And special credit to Mikhail Yathabal, who's now the, in the top three in terms of goal scorers in, of Ross Sudat in the 21st century. First is my boy, Carlos Vela, who I love so much. So, and hopefully one day he comes back to Spain. But, but ultra credit to Yathabal, standard win for Ross Sudat. And it was also standard win for the rivals, Athletic Bilbao. Their coach, Marcelino, said that. For them to finish in top half, they have to be strong at home. And I think they were exactly that against Mallorca. It wasn't pretty. It wasn't fun. But it was a professional display. And he scored thanks to a nice set piece and constant pressure in the second half. The one thing I do worry about them is, is their lack of offensive threat. Because they are a good defensive team. But at the same time... I feel they lack that offensive presence and they lack that flair. And that's why I don't understand why Nico Williams doesn't get enough minutes. Because every time I see this kid play, I get off my seat because he is an exciting kid to watch. He's someone who has been described as the best Neymar. And you can tell by the way he plays, by the way he gets past people. He always wants to get past. He always wants to do something different. And if they are to finish in Europe, I feel they need more of that and less of the standard British approach from them. And yeah, speaking about Flair, Raya Vallecano, how wasteful were they this, this weekend? They played against Levante, they had 20 shots, and I'm not just talking about like blazing it from halfway out or something. These were one-on-one -on -one chances. These were chances where the expected goals must have been off the charts. In fact, they should have beaten Levante by 3-1 according to expected goals. But their lack of definition in the final third really hurt them. And they are really going to need Falcao when he comes back, when, when he comes back because he's a new sign-in. And I was sort of happy for them when they got the equalizer because I felt they deserved it. But they are still lacking that efficiency. And poor Levante, let's spare a thought for them because they've lost six points from winning positions it's incredible how sometimes they can be lackadaisical defensively or they don't know how to defend, to, to put it bluntly. But they're a fun team, they like going forward. And I just bash Kalev for being ultra defensive, so I'm not going to bash them for being, for not knowing how to defend. I would rather you not know how to defend and be offensive. It's just the style of football that I like, so. Yeah, and speaking about exciting teams, somewhat Real Betis and. An exciting Andalusian derby got the win. Late winner from Canales. Both goals Betis scored were a work of art. Rodri was a brilliant finish. As well as Canales, his run was... I, I compared it to Ronaldo's run at Compostela. And it was maybe maybe not as good as that, but it was like that-esque. And poor Granada. Robert Moreno's project hasn't got off to a good start. He's still chasing the shadow of Diego Martinez. And they're without a win in four games. In the last game they played before the break, they got destroyed by Raya Vallecano. Things might need to change for them on, unless his job might be on the line. And another person, new manager, also really handsome guy, whose job might be, be on the line is Michel because Hetafe have lost the opening four games. You could give Hetafe a bit of leeway and say that, okay, the first three were difficult games, Valencia, Sevilla, Barcelona, but they really should be winning against Elche. Even though Elche, they've had a really good summer. They brought in Javier Pastore, they brought in Dario Benedetto. It seems like they have a really good team, but Hetafe also have a good team, and I was really impressed with how they played against Sevilla, against Barcelona. 
to some extent against Valencia because even in the Valencia game they should have won it they had enough shots to win it but if the results keep on going in the trend they are it might be Christmas for Michelle and that that was all we saw in the La Liga weekend I felt it was an interesting weekend but it's a weekend where we're beginning to see a trend where the high flyers are going away from a lot of teams that are struggling to get off the pick, struggling to get off the off the ground in their seasons. There are eight teams that haven't won in La Liga this season, and hopefully that changes over the course of the week because we do want to see a competitive league, one where, like last season, it will be tied up until the end and we'll have races in so many different places. But now that we're done La Liga business, it's time to fly around Europe. And the league I want to talk about is the Bundesliga. And I love the Bundesliga. I know it has a lot of stereotypes, but I feel in terms of the games, the actual games you see, it's the most entertaining league in Europe. Only Serie A is as close as this. And you see crazy games like what we saw with Leverkusen versus Dortmund, where Dortmund where it had to come back several times. Finally, the great Hurling Holland, the great robot who has no emotions, all he cares about is goals. He scored the winner, and that keeps Dortmund like still in pace with Bayern Munich. And Holland is going to have fun in his Champions League group. He's going to have so much fun because Ajax and Sporting are the next strongest opponents, and I don't think either team has enough in the defense to be able to stop him. So I think he's going to score like a buttload of goals and the UCL group stages. And speaking about the bad of the Bundesliga, we just spoke about the great of the Bundesliga. Bayern poaching from their opponents. Either it's the second best team or the third best team in Germany. You have a great manager. You have a great winger. You have a great defender. Here comes Bayern Munich to buy them all. And that's what they did. And we saw them in full display against Leipzig, who were a great team last season, but now they struggled to get off the ground. Bayern thumped them 4-1. Watch out for Musiala, who's going to be another shining light in the next couple of years. I think he might be as good as Pedri, but we'll see about that. And yeah, like, even Triple Moting scored against Leipzig. Triple Moting! Come on, Leipzig. You can do better than this. And I still feel Leipzig will finish in the top four. But we'll have to wait and see. With Bayern, they have Barcelona. The members come back with the 8-2. Yeah, <laughs> it might be tough for it might be a tough game for for Barcelona for that one, but I think Barca can maybe sneak a draw. I think apart from this game, Bayern has shown some weaknesses early on, but it, it is Bayern Munich, and in the Champions League, it's they're a different animal. So we'll see what happens then. And the team that's with the hottest streak in the Bundesliga, it's not Bayern, it's not Dortmund, it's obviously not Leipzig. So who is it? It's Wolfsburg. Wolfsburg managed by Mark Van Bommel, who is a former PSV, Barcelona legend. I believe he also played for Milan as well. And I'm happy for him because like he, a lot of the PSV managers who have come out of PSV recently that have won the league, they haven't really done that well. So with Van Bommel, I'm happy that he's shown in Europe that he's a competent manager. He's led Wolfsburg into the Champions League, and we're going to see how well they do. I think they should get out of their group in the Champions League because the group is not... It's For them, it might be overly complicated, but it's not like they have a European heavyweight like City or PSG or Bayern or Barcelona or maybe not Barcelona or Real Madrid. You get my point. And it's, there's have Sevilla, Leo, and Salzburg, so... Realistically, they have a chance of going out of this group, and I believe they should. I believe they should. And speaking of teams who also with 100% record, let's move to France, where Paris Saint-Germain is like, li loving life in Liga. They thrash Clement Foot for zero. I think that's how you pronounce it. And the Herrera surprisingly got a brace in this game, which is so weird whenever players like him score. Also, Idrissa Ganagé also scored in this game, so it was like the game of midfielders. But as usual, Kylian Mbappe scores. Leo Messi, Di Maria, the South Americans didn't play this game because of like common ball reasons. And that's somewhat the same reason why Sevilla and Barcelona got postponed because Sevilla have lots of South American players 
and it would have affected the integrity of the league in quotation marks if the game had been played. But we're in France, we're not in Spain, so let's stick to France. The team that's going to be hot on the trail is Marseille, who is managed by Jorge Sampaoli. And with Sampaoli, they, they've been impressing so far this season. They haven't lost the game. They've only drawn one. They beat Monaco, which were one of the top teams that season, but they are struggling this year. They've struggled to get out of the shell, especially after what happened with Shakhtar Donetsk, so we can forgive them for that. Also, Lille. Lille have been struggling as well. They recently lost to Lorient 3-2, and they've gotten five points out of their opening five games, which is terrible for a defending champion. And that's part of the reason why I think Wolfsburg will go through in that in that group. I think it's going to be Sevilla Wolfsburg, and Lille might actually struggle to finish third in that group. Because Salzburg, although they lost their, their manager as well, we're seeing a theme here, <laughs> I think they're still an incredibly competitive team because the strength of the Red Bull teams isn't really the manager, it's the system. and Which is why I wouldn't feel so bad for Leipzig as well. But yeah, speaking of struggling teams, let's transition and fly over to Italia, where Juventus haven't started the season well. They lost to Napoli, all credit to Napoli. Great game from by them. Beating Juventus is no mean feat, it, regardless of where they are. And now it seems like it's time to panic in Juventus. Let's all press the panic button. Ronaldo's gone, no goals. <sighs> but let's remember, let's rewind back to 2015-2016. Tevez was gone. Everyone was panicking. Oh no, Juventus, they're not going to win Serie A this year. And surprise, surprise, they do win Serie A this year, that year. And similar things might happen because it's the same coach who got them to win Serie A after a poor start. That's there right now. But it's not the same team, and I do think this team needs a lot of like construction in terms of playing a different style, and those things do take time. And so it might take them a while, but... I wouldn't expect Juve to struggle like this for an elongated period of time. Although, like, I think it would be too simplistic of me to say that they'll just come back from that because the league has changed and there are lots of like top quality managers who have come into the league. Like Spalletti, who was manager Napoli, who beat them. Mauricio Sarri at Lazio. Or Jose Mourinho, the special one at Roma, who had his 1,000th game against Sassuolo, and it was a last-minute winner from El Sharawi that led to pandemonium in the Stadio Olimpico. You see Mourinho running around. Great scenes, great goal. And you know what? He's a legend of the game in terms of managerial styles, and I'm happy that he's doing well. I wish him the best of luck at Roma, because they're a club who have gone through hard times recently, and they do need a manager like him to bring them back to where they believe they should be. And one of his former clubs, Inter, they didn't get off to such a great start. They weren't so hot this weekend against Sampdoria. But it's one of those things where like teams have to drop points somewhere. Otherwise, we'll be in a league where like every team has like 111 points, like some FIFA glitch, right? So like I won't read too much about this. I do think Inter are still the favorites to win the Scudetto this year. But their city rivals, Milan, might have something to say about it, especially if... The Zlatan, the god, keeps scoring, and they beat Lazio, which isn't a Mickey Mouse team. They, they're a strong team, and it's sort of somewhat of a statement. They have a big clash against Liverpool, repeat of the Champions League final. Both Champions League finals, depending on which one, which supporter you are, Milan and Liverpool, you might be attracted to one narrative of that final. Uh, yeah, so it's going to be interesting to see how they do in the Champions League as well. And... Speaking of good players who are in their past their mid-30s who are still killing it, you have Cristiano Ronaldo, who came back to Manchester United, and he thrived this weekend. He scored a brace against Newcastle, one of his favorite opponents, actually. Um, if you go back into time, there was this fixture between them where I think it was 0-0 at halftime, and in second half, United blitz them and Cristiano scored an amazing goal in that match. You can check YouTube and I think it's still there. Like he loves scoring against them. It might be a, t a race between him and Lukaku 
for the golden shoes. So it's going to be interesting to see how that sort of race ends. I think Lukaku might beat him, actually. I think so. I think he's just younger, more powerful. I think he's built made for England. I was surprised he failed in his first in his thing that Manchester United, but we've seen how good he's been since he moved to Inter. And with the right coach, which I think Tucho is, he has the right recipes to succeed. City and Liverpool also won this weekend. Um, my thoughts go out to Liverpool's Elliot. It was a fit challenge. I hope he can get back on his feet as soon as possible. But this weekend, if you could pick a game that you'd say might be pivotal in a title race, I'll pick Sporting Porto, which ended in a tie. Sporting, and that they lose, they lost ground to lose ground. They lost ground to Benfica, who thrashed their farm team, Santa Clara. And for those who don't understand why I call them a farm team, their crests are very similar. You should see that on the screen. And it's going to be a three-horse race in Portugal again this season. But last season, it wasn't so much a three-horse race because Sporting ran away with it. And that's it for my review of Spanish football and some bits of European football. This is the first edition of this podcast. If you like it, please leave a like and subscribe. And also leave a comment to tell me things I can improve on if I'm speaking too fast or too slowly or you don't like my jokes. I won't take it personally. But thank you for listening. If you want to follow me on other platforms, you can follow me at Tajuddin Triple Tajuddin Triple Zero. It should be the same thing for Instagram or Twitter. I'm your host Tajuddin. It's been nice talking to you and see you next week.